Please now enter into a time of confession and forgiveness with me. The Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin together. Have mercy on us, gracious God. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. And now I'd like to welcome Dustin Schwartz, a member of our strategic planning team with an update from our strategic planning process for each and every one of you. As Holy Spirit Lutheran Church enters a new season, it was time to step back and kick up the dust, revisit things that are working really well, understand the resources we have in place, and put down on paper what we, as a church, want to achieve. Holy Spirit is a church that actively plans for its future. A key part of this plan is a commitment to complete a strategic plan every five years. So here we are. My name is Dustin Schwartz. I am one of about 25 members of this congregation that participated in two weekend sessions to kick off the strategic planning process. Pastor Nathan Swenson Reinhold orchestrated these sessions. Pastor Jim and Pastor Josh were active participants. The remaining individuals were selected to represent a cross section of our dynamic church. We initiated the retreat by revisiting Holy Spirit's vision, mission, and our core values, each of these central to the work done and the initiatives created. Our vision, to be a community that functions according to God's design and the purpose for His church. Our mission, to intentionally and deliberately seek out and welcome all people, churched, unchurched, and members, and assist all in becoming fully devoted followers of Christ. Our core values, being Christ-centered and relevant, actively serving others, being good stewards of our blessings, engaging worship experiences, everyone involved in ministry, and being relationship-driven. We spent those first two days, in Pastor Nathan's words, kicking the dust up. Where are we as a church today? What do we want to be? What are we as a church called to do? And how do we get there? The team was honest in its assessments of our church's strengths. We have two strong pastors. 
many strong lay leaders. We expect church members to be involved. We have vast outreach programs. The list goes on. And our weaknesses. We rely heavily on a select few, both staff and lay people to lead us. We know we can provide a better church home for our youth and seasonal members. There are many more here too. We were ambitious to develop a plan. The goal was to develop initiatives that the church will focus on over the next several years. With the grace and direction provided by our God, we are excited to share our five initiatives with you. We expect they will set up Holy Spirit to better serve our Lord, our community, and the people we reach. Congregational engagement will make it easier and simpler to get involved in church activities. A balance of technology and personal touch will be leveraged to communicate all that is going on and to provide that nudge many of us need to join in on the action. Strategic staffing emphasizes the importance of our staff. Our staff will be set up for success in well-defined roles to ensure our church is positioned to deliver on these initiatives. Facilities deployment will figure out how we can best utilize this campus to serve. From modifications to the worship center, to a dedicated youth space, to addressing limitations of the current kitchen, this team will consider many options in the coming years. Spark groups will provide a new vehicle for individuals to develop relationships within the church and a means to welcome those from outside the church into a smaller group setting. These groups will share, they will pray, they will achieve, reach, and connect. Digital Campus will push us toward reaching the all in our mission statement. This will bring God's word to where people are by delivering short form and long form content intended for digital delivery. These are big initiatives and they are fully achievable. There's a champion and team actively working on each one. They're establishing goals, setting timelines to achieve them in, and getting to work. A few of the initiatives will, with purpose, take time to unfold. Others will drive a more immediate impact. We will roll out communications around each one, what you can expect to see and be involved with, and when. We are excited to use this direction to build on the strong foundation Holy Spirit has. In closing, I want to share a reflection we experienced on the final day of the strategic planning retreat. Each person in the room was asked to share one word to explain how they were feeling at that very moment. And here is what they had to say. Now we have the Lord's work to do, and we are going to have fun getting it done together. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Pastor Josh Pontius, and I'm excited to be joining you with Worship Digitally today. Thank you for joining us. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Jeremiah, the 27th chapter. In the beginning of the reign of King Zedekiah, son of Josiah of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus the Lord said to me, Make yourself a yoke of straps and bars, and put them on your neck. Send word to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the Ammonites, the king of Tyre, and the king of Sidon, by the hand of the envoys who have come to Jerusalem, to King Zedekiah of Judah. Give them this charge for their masters. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, this is what you shall say to your masters. It is I who by my great power and my outstretched arm have made the earth with the people and animals that are on the earth, and I give it to whomever I please. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, my servant, and I have given him even the wild animals of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him, and his son and his grandson, until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings shall make him their slave. But if any nation or kingdom will not serve this king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, then I will punish that nation with the sword, with famine and with pestilence, says the Lord until I have completed its destruction by his hand. You, therefore, must not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, or your sorcerers, who are saying to you, You shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they are prophesying a lie to you, with the result that you will be removed far from your land. I will drive you out, and you will perish. But any nation that will bring its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will leave on its own land, says the Lord, to till it and live there. I spoke to King Zedekiah of Judah in the same way. Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. God, we know that you can use anyone and anything for your purposes. Help us to be receptive to your word. Help us to hear what you would have us do. Help us to do what you would have us do, whatever it may be. No matter who we are, what we are capable of, we know that you have put it on our hearts to seek your will and your mission in this world. We ask all of this in the same of your nun, name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, hello again and welcome back to this second part in our series, God Can Use anyone. Today we're looking at King Nebuchadnezzar. In case you're wondering, that is in fact how you pronounce that name. And yet here we are, the second week in the series. Last week we looked at Pharaoh, and this week we've got another person who is seemingly playing the part of a villain. See, King Nebuchadnezzar is the leader of Babylon, and here's what you need to hear about him. He is the bad guy of bad guys in the story of Israel. This is the worst of the worst, because you see, this is the king, this is the leader of the group that's going to come in to a divided Israel. It's been split up into Israel and Judah. And he's going to take over the last little bits. He is going to take over Jerusalem. He is going to kick all of its kings and its court, its prophets, all of its religious leaders out of the city. And not only that, he is going to sack the temple, the temple where God is said to live here on earth, where his throne on earth is. He's going to take all of its valuables and burn it to the ground. Wow, this is a bad dude. But wait. The prophet Jeremiah in today's reading says, he brings this word from God that says, Hey, wait, this bad guy, this guy who I'm already telling you is going to do all of these awful things, is actually the appointed one of God that God calls his servant, and this is who we're supposed to honor and serve and pay attention to. Wait, what? No, 
No, no, no, no, no, no, no. No, there's no way. Jeremiah has to have it wrong, right? This is a bad guy. This is the bad guy of bad guys. See, this is already following a period in the history of God's people when the people of Israel and Judah, those two kingdoms, they split off. There's a whole big mess there. They just couldn't get anything right. They just, just doing nothing right. Everything that they could do wrong, that's what they did. This people who had been liberated from slavery in Egypt, who had been given this promised land, this people who God says, I am going to be my, your God. You are going to be my people. Just worship me. Follow my commandments. And man, we are going to be great. Nope. This turns into an absolute disaster of a situation. Everything they could be doing wrong, they were. They weren't caring for the widow and the orphan. They were storing up all their riches for themselves. They weren't caring for those who were most desperately in need. And not only that, even in God's house, in the temple in Jerusalem, there were other deities that they were starting to worship. They were doing everything wrong. What a disaster of a situation. These people who had had all of these promises given to them, the ones who were called to carry God's story, God's laws, God's commandments to the whole world, just get it all wrong. These ones who have heard the promises every time a little stumble comes up in the road, every time something goes just a little bit wrong, they immediately say, okay, God, whatever you're up to, I don't trust it. I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And every time you take those matters into your own hands and you don't leave them to God, you just dig your own hole just a little bit deeper. You get deeper and deeper into the awfulness rather than into the life that they've been called to. And so it's at this point in the story where we've already gotten a few of the prophets talking, hey, God has told you what to do. You know his laws. You know his commandments. But you're falling short, so we're going to try something different. I'm going to call you back to what God has called us to. The book of Isaiah, just before this one, is full of that. Guys, you're getting it wrong. This is not what God's up to. Here's what we need to be doing instead. And the people still don't listen. Yeah, sometimes, every once in a while, a prophet will come along and the people will say, okay, yeah, we can get things a little better. We'll do it and it gets a little better. But this is just a time and place in the people's history where, man, just everything is going wrong. They can't get it right. And so instead of just sending the prophet Jeremiah to say, hey, it's time to turn around, God picks someone outside of this chosen group of people to be appointed as their leader and his instrument of judgment on the people he has so often chosen to show favor to, this people of Israel. Now, we've all heard of stories both in the history and in the present of our world where somebody gets up in front of a group of people and says, I am God's appointed leader. Follow me because God has chosen me to be your political or religious leader. That's not what's happening here. God is speaking through the prophet of his people that somebody from the outside is in charge, that God has appointed them. So where does this story lead? See, King Nebuchadnezzar isn't just appointed as leader of the people in this text. He is the guy who reigns over the fall of God's kingdom here on earth, as it was at the time. The prophet Isaiah set up that this was going to happen. Jeremiah talks about it. Ezekiel talks about it. The book of Daniel talks about it. Second Kings all take place in the same time period where we see the people are lost. The people are sent away. At least their leaders are. And a number of the important people, a good portion of the city is emptied. Where does it leave our people? Not where God's promised land is. They are in exile. They're not even allowed to return home. They're not allowed to worship in the space that God has set aside where God says, this is where I will be. This is where your sacrifices can take place. These prophets then start talking. They start talking to the people through what God is telling them. 
See, they're in exile. They're not in their homes. They're not in the places that God has called them to be. And these prophets start telling them stories of deliverance, of an end to the troubles at hand, to this situation that is so awful that they are going to be saved from it. But in addition to being saved from their present troubles there in exile, they start pointing to a bigger deliverance, a bigger saving, a bigger promise that God has in store, not just for his people Israel, but for the whole world. A promised future, a real deliverance, a real saving from all of those things that weigh us down. You see, Nebuchadnezzar is a bad guy, but his part in the story is critical. Not just in today's story, but his place in history as an instrument of God's judgment that helps the people to understand just what God is up to. That they can't save themselves either from this immediate exile or from the bigger places and troubles of sin and death. They can't do it. But God can. It's in this point in the story that we start to see the promises, not just of that immediate saving, but of the one who would come to save us all. The story of the Messiah, the Savior of the whole world. This is the time where God's people start clamoring for someone to save us and start to recognize, I can't do it, you can't do it, only God can save us. And there is a bigger story at work here. Not something they can do. Because they can't get it right. If there's anything we can see from this entire part of the story is that they can't do anything right. They can't save themselves. They can't do enough good. They can't do even a little bit of good most times. God's work, God's promises are coming into their fullest expression. This is where those promises start to come through. This is where God's continually reminding his people, I've got something better in store for you. This isn't the end. There's something greater at work here. I have incredible plans for you. Now, you may have heard this before. You can't do it on your own. You can't reach salvation on your own. You can't get forgiveness on your own. You can't get things right on your own. And for those of us who grew up hearing these stories over and over again, sound like a broken record. These are things you've heard before. They're things I've heard before. And most of us who are hearing this message now have heard this before. You can't save yourself. You can't deliver yourself from the troubles of this world. Only God can. Most of us know that. But we live in a world where more and more people don't. Where more and more people hear that they are in charge of their own destiny. They control their future. If they just work hard enough, if they just try hard enough, if they just do enough good, that things will work out well for them. Things will go right for them. Everything will be fine. There's nothing that they're going to have to worry about. They don't know the story. They don't see all the times and places where... The whole world has fallen short on that. They keep trying again and again. I'm sure each and every one of us knows somebody who no matter what they try to make things right for themselves, it just keeps getting worse. You see, we typically think of this time of Lent leading up to Easter as just being a penitential one, of one where we reflect on what we can't do right. And it's a season of Advent, that season before Christmas, where we have this anticipation of the one to come. But this story reminds us that God is continually reminding his people that he's got a bigger thing in store. See, we know As people of God, those of us who have encountered this cycle before that Easter is coming, just like we know every year that Christmas is coming, we can have a situation where there's an anticipation and a longing and a hope for that grace and forgiveness that is found not just on the cross at the end of this season, but in that empty grave on Easter Sunday. But see, we know that and we live in a world that increasingly doesn't know that, hasn't heard those promises, doesn't know what's coming next. And see, we get to play a role just like Nebuchadnezzar. 
We get to show the people that don't know the story that they can't save themselves. We get to explain to them where true grace, where true forgiveness, where true freedom comes from. That's who we are called to be as people of God. And now, I think I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, right now, I am not equipped for that. I'm not ready to share my story. I don't know the Bible well enough. I don't know scripture well enough. I haven't taken enough classes. Maybe I'm not comfortable speaking. Maybe I don't have the training. I haven't had the classes. I haven't had the lessons. I can't share this story of God's deliverance for somebody who doesn't know it yet. I'm not the right person to bring that story to people. And I'll say this, just like the title of the series, we'll see God can use anyone. If God can use a bad dude like King Nebuchadnezzar, he can sure use a person like you or like me to be a voice of hope, to be the voice of calm to a world that is increasingly trying harder and harder to do it, it, them, everything themselves and realizing they're coming up short. We can help remind people that we have a God who loves us no matter what, who saves us not through what we can do, but through his own divine justice and mercy. We get to be that voice. We get to be that community of faith. We get to be that loving presence where we can show people it's not up to you. It's not up to me. But there is a God who knows, who loves, and who saves us through that incredible work on the cross. It's a story I want you all to hear. It's a story I want you to share. Not just with those in the immediate circles that you have, but share with the whole world. This good news that we don't have to get it right, but that God does. Amen. With the whole church, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please pray with me. God, we know that Jesus formed his disciples in the ways of extravagant mercy and profound welcome. Lead your church to be a community marked by forgiveness, hospitality, and celebration. Send us to transform a world plagued by fear of condemnation and insecurity. God, we know that countries are divided and leaders often harbor grudges against each other. Reconcile nations that experience conflict. We pray today especially for the people and leadership of Ukraine. Help all of them to make decisions that are in the best interest of their people to protect and serve those people who they are called to lead. God, act quickly to bring an end to that war and to all wars. Help peacemakers to negotiate and to do what's in the best interest of all, fostering a spirit of diplomacy and collaboration among all political rivals. Help soften the hearts of those who see violence as the main way to achieve their ends in this world. Help them to see the way of peace and prosperity for all people and help them to see the face of you in those that they would seek to harm in their search for power. God, your people cry for help in times of distress. Resolve disagreements among family members. Save those experiencing financial hardship. God, we ask you to hear our prayers for those who are sick or grieving. We pray especially for Judy, Karen, April, Rachel, Janet, Eric, Chris, and Skip, and all those who we name before you now. 
God, console us with the promise that everything, everything can become new. God, the one who was dead is alive again. We give thanks for those who have died. Confident and steadfast love surrounds them. Shelter them in your love until we are all gathered at your heavenly banquet. God, accept these prayers that we bring on behalf of a world in need for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen. My name is Pastor Josh Pontius, and I have a few announcements to share with you this week. If you're able to join us in person, our Lenten Soup and Study continues this Wednesday, March the 30th at noon and at 6 p.m. We gather for soup and do a fairly brief study about one of the first five books of the Old Testament. And if you're thinking, I've already missed three, there's no way I can jump in on this fourth one, there is nothing from each week that you need to have heard before to join us. So come, have some soup, have a good time and conversation, learn a little bit more about the Bible at the same time. I think it's a win-win. That, and you don't have to worry about lunch and or dinner for that day. If you are in person or joining us online, we are doing our annual envelope fundraiser. If you're here in person, there is a giant board out front with little envelopes with different numbers on them. You can grab one of those. The number on the outside is the number of dollars you are committing to go to our youth program. If you're joining us online, you can just donate directly to the summer youth programming uh, in the donate tab. This is the last Sunday to help. Um, This is what ensures our youth and young people are all able to attend camp and go without it being a financial burden on themselves. So I'd really like to encourage you to participate. Uh, This is that last Sunday. Our Holy Week worship is now posted on our website. A couple of quick little programming notes uh, that's a little different from previous years. This year, our Maundy Thursday services at noon and seven are gonna be held in a more traditional organ and choir led format. This year, our uh, worship band will be leading our Good Friday services also at 12 and 7. That's going to be a tenebrae service. Um, It's going to be really special. It's going to be really unique. So I'd like to encourage you to join us at both of those services. Speaking of Holy Week services, we have gotten word that Juno Beach has formally approved our peer services that are going to be at the Juno Beach Pier at 645 and 845 in the morning on Easter Sunday. If you're able to join us in person for those, it I've been told it's an incredible opportunity to see God at work in the community. Here's the thing. A lot goes into making those services happen. We need lots of volunteers so that we can faithfully serve and spread good news to the people who join us there on the beach. 
Therefore, on April the 3rd, after each and every service, there is going to be a volunteer meeting. So if you can make that um, in an attempt to help learn how you can help serve at those peer services, we would love to have you there on April the 3rd. As you might have been able to tell, this is a very active place for people of all ages and all abilities. Our website is always up to date with information on our events, or you could always check out our church app. It's pretty easy to use, and if you need a little bit of help getting it set up the first time, there's a tutorial video on our website at hslcjuno.org.